It's a rough New York City crowd, but I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm Harry Katz. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm a professor at the ILR, ILR School. I teach courses on collective bargaining and labor relations more broadly. And I also serve, uh, I'm pleased to say, as the director of the Scheinman uh, Institute. Um, I want to just say a few things about how this conference got started and then go through some administrative matters. And then I want to introduce uh, Homer LaRue and uh, Alex Colvin, who will say a few remarks. And then we'll jump into the program and turn it over to our panelists who are congregated here, but will come forward. And all. just uh, some things I want to say about how this got going. Uh, what, what had happened was more than a year ago, uh, a, a number of us involved in the Scheinman Institute were in conversations with folks at the National Academy of Arbitration, and um, we talked about the fact that there was likely to be a retirement wave occurring within the profession, and the profession wasn't well prepared to deal with that. And we also talked about the virtues uh, of having an inclusive process, if we could uh, promote one, that would address uh, the uh, lack of demographic diversity within the profession and also meet the need of having a next generation, um, uh, diverse or not. There's a, a, a need for more uh, neutrals uh, in, that, in the face of that wave. So that's how it got started. Uh, we then created, with the cooperation of the National Academy, a, uh, a planning committee. Uh, six members of the National Academy uh, then met with a handful of us ILR faculty on a regular basis. And then uh, we went ahead and uh, invited a number of you to participate on what we called an advisory uh, committee. And there were 15 uh, folks on that advisory committee meeting periodically uh, with us, giving us advice about how to structure this, this meeting and all. I want to thank all of you who served on that advisory committee. You'll see their names uh, listed on the attendee list along with emails, and then we also list all your names and emails. If, if there's things incorrect on that list, it really is my fault. Blame me, not just because it's nice to say blame me, but I personally <laughs> was most likely the source of, of any uh, uh, typographical errors. Um, uh, we then uh, proceeded to sort of seek support in addition to getting financial support from the NAA, and we thank them for that, for this uh, event. We also received significant financial support from the American Arbitration Association. I particularly thank uh, Christine and Jeff for their help in facilitating, and Anne also contributed to that help in, in getting financial support from the AAA to complement the support from uh, the National Academy. Um, and um, we basically, you know, we'll be talking in, in many uh, times about, about uh, the function and purpose of, of what we met, so I won't go into that in detail yet. Um, I just have a few other administrative things to say. Uh, there is CLE credit available, New York State CLE credit available. You can sign the sheet outside the door on the table. There's information in your packet in addition to what I just mentioned, an attendee list, another copy of the consortium proposal, which we'll discuss periodically over the next day and a half. Uh, we also have a, a flyer uh, uh, describing a labor arbitrator development program we run at ILR. We'll mention a little bit about that along, along the way. Um, let's see, a few other administrative things. Um, we do have a release form in your packet. That's just about the fact that we like to publicize what we do at ILR on our website, we're, we're, uh, and we would appreciate it if you'd sign that. That, that. that doesn't mean you're committed to anything we talk about in this room. We're not going to say that. It's just that you participated in this uh, discussion. I, I might add, when we get to the panel here, we are going to record that uh, because we want to use that in future uh, teaching at the ILR school, but nothing else uh, over the next day and a half is going to be uh, recorded, uh, in, other than possibly your image as part of the, the discussion. 
Um, so uh, let me now uh, turn it over to uh, my dear colleague who has helped me and others immensely in pulling this off. Uh, and I'm pleased to then introduce Homer LaRue, the current president of the National Academy. Thank you very much, Harry, and good morning to all of you and welcome. It's a pleasure to stand here today uh, with you, even though I'm the only one except Scott who got the memo that said no tie until this evening. <laughs> so I'm a little underdressed compared to the rest of my panelists, but be that as it may. You know, as I, I also want to thank Dean uh, Colvin for his contribution to today's event and to the ILR school as well. Uh, as some of you know, my roots go way back with the ILR school, uh, back to graduate school and, there, and before that to the law school. So I have, this is a great coming home. What I wanted as I was be beginning, or not beginning, but ending making some notes, uh, a song came to my mind, the, uh, an old one, an old Pete Seeger song. Where have all the flowers gone? And it stuck with me as I was beginning to make my introductory remarks, and I saw an analogy between what we're trying to do here. I know where all the arbitrators and mediators are going, at least the ones who are my age, and many of us are baby boomers. And so it's fitting for us to do what we're doing here today, and it is historic. As Harry has indicated, what we are called here to do today is to identify, nurture, train the next generation of neutrals. And in doing that, to ensure that that next generation of neutrals represents the workforce that we know today and that we will know in the future. And so in my short remarks here, I want to be very clear about my intention, and I hope that you will be able to join me in that intention. First of all, I hope that we will have, over the next day and a half, a dialogue, an open and frank dialogue about how we go forward. And let me move to the, to the conclusion of that dialogue. This meeting, in my mind, is a call to action. It is a call to action by advocates, by neutrals, to begin to formulate the next generation of neutrals. And to do that in a concrete way. I hope we don't leave here merely feeling good that we talked once more about the need for diversity, about the need for a new generation of neutrals. I hope that we leave here with a plan of action about how to concretize that aspiration, to make it a reality. And so the second thing is I hope this dialogue then leads to a consensus in principle anyway to go forward with a plan of action. It may not be the consortium plan that we've laid out for you as a groundwork to give you something concrete to talk about. But we hope that we will walk away from here with a tentative agreement that we are going to come up with some kind of plan, perhaps based on what you are going to be talking about today, perhaps modified, perhaps something radically different. But that we, when Cornell puts on, the web, on their web page what this was about, it will be seen as a historic moment when this community, i.e. the ADR community, decided to make a difference. And that's what we're here to do today through Friday. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment. We look forward to the conversation, to the dialogue, to the call to action. Thanks, Homer. And, and it's now my pleasure to introduce the dean of the ILR School, Alex Colvin, who we're proud of for many reasons, including the fact that he's a major researcher in the field of conflict resolution, as you may know. But in addition, he's the dean. Alex, it's all yours. Great. 
Thanks, Harry. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. We are at the ILR School's New York City facilities, and it's our pleasure to be hosting you here today. Uh, but it's also our pleasure to be part of this effort, which I think is an incredibly important one. It's a pleasure to be partnering with the National Academy. Uh, Homer's leadership in this area has been really something that uh, I think is inspiring, and uh, uh, we're committed to this effort. Uh, it's great to see the representatives of the administering agencies here, the advocates, the neutrals, the coming together here is a wonderful thing to see. I think that's really important for this effort to be successful. This is something that's important to our school. It goes right back to our roots. Uh, 1945, we started with a statute, uh, New York State, uh, Co Governor Thomas Dewey uh, signed us into existence with a statute saying that we had a mission of improving labor management relations in this state. Uh, that led us over the years to educate and train many of the leading neutrals uh, in practice. When we think about that mission today, that continues to be core to what we do. When we established the Simon Institute on Conflict Resolution, educating the next generation of neutrals was the tagline. That's still part of our mission. It's expanded, though. It's not just traditional labor arbitration. We've expanded out uh, the dispute resolution tools and settings in which we use them, what we educate about. But it's still that core idea of this is really important for society, for the economy, to do this well. And so we're really committed to this effort of trying to bring into the profession a new generation of neutrals uh, that will carry forward a really important and successful legacy, but do it adapted to the needs of the modern world and society. My own research, as Harry mentioned, is in the workplace conflict resolution area. I look at dispute resolution procedures. And across a lot of my research, one of the really common themes I've found is that the quality of neutrals matters. Who is the arbitrator? Who is the mediator? Who's in the room doing that important work? That matters. Uh, now, that certainly means quality and uh, certainly the people in this room represent that. It's important that we continue that. Educating and getting into the profession, that next generation, it's important that they have the ability that so many of you have had to successfully resolve disputes. However, I think it's also essential that that be a representative group of neutrals for this profession to continue to serve the function it has served. Uh, in a modern society, I think you have to be diverse and inclusive in the way that society is diverse and inclusive if we're going to be successful and have the credibility that is essential to this profession being successful and making the contribution that it can make. So I think this is a really important effort. I think it's important uh, on principle. I think it's important for a practical sense. I think for the continued success of the neutral profession to make the contribution it can make, it has to be that diverse, inclusive profession that we want it to be. And that's, I think, what this effort's all about. So we're really proud to be part of the effort and we're fully committed to uh, making our contribution to making it successful. Thanks, Thanks so much, Alex. Um, so um, for a few moments, I want to put on my academic hat and, and then I want to introduce our esteemed uh, uh, panelists to get us going into substantive matters. Uh, putting on my academic hat, what I want to do is just talk with you about what the data shows regarding the composition of workplace neutrals in, in the United uh, States. Uh, so it's, it's not just our own personal impression that many of us are at the brink of retirement or beginning to phase into retirement. Uh, the data show that as well. And the data also show concretely uh, that there's not a significant amount of diversity, uh, demographic diversity, in the individuals who currently are involved arbitrating and mediating at the workplace. So I'm going to refer to three surveys. Uh, they were uh, completed uh, by ILR faculty. I look for other surveys, but, you know, once again, the to be honest, the best ones are those produced by ILRs. What do you know? I often said that when I was dean, and I can say it again. The first survey I'm going to refer to was done in 1999 by uh, the late David Lipsky. Um, the uh, other survey I'll refer to was done 
in 2015 by Alex and his student at the time, Mark Goff, uh, who's now gone on to teach at Penn State. Uh, and the, the third survey I'll talk about is one uh, we uh, at ILR uh, completed as a team uh, with support from the NAA. Uh, just uh, uh, some of you must, might have uh, filled it out. In 2022, we did a survey of National Academy uh, members. Uh, so wh- what, is, what does that survey data show? Uh, with regard to the percent of, of arbitrator, workplace arbitrators and mediators uh, who are uh, non-white, um, uh, there's two different populations surveyed. Let me make that clear, um, and I'll try and highlight that. W- one it, it are surveys of just NAA members, and then um, Alex and Mark also surveyed employment arbitrators, people involved doing employment arbitration who were not NAA members. Now, obviously, a number of you and other NAA members do some employment arbitration, but again, uh, I'll, I'll report to you, uh, because there's a bit more de- demographic diversity within that population who uh, does employment arb- has done uh, employment arbitration on, on a continuing basis, but they're not members of the NAA. So anyway, here's what the data show. The percent uh, of the NAA membership that are non-white uh, recorded in 2015 is 5%. Um, uh, the same percent uh, is reported in 2022. So I know there's meaningful efforts by a number of you and your organizations uh, to uh, add to the the diversity within the profession. It it just hasn't shown up yet in NAA membership, and that's part of the reason we all think we need to commit to doing more. Um, uh, Among those that Alex and Mark surveyed who do employment arbitration but are not members of the NAA, um, uh, 8% of that population is non-white. Uh, on the percent female side, uh, a, a little bit more diverse, uh, uh, and that is in the 1999 survey that Dave Lipsky did of NAA membership, 12% of NAA members uh, were uh, female at the time. Uh, that number has grown uh, to 20%, but here's an interesting uh, aspect of that. It was 20% female in 2015 among NAA, and it still is 20% female uh, in our most recent 2022 survey. Employment arbitrators who are not members of the NAA, uh, there in 2015, again, they were surveyed by, by Alex and Mark, 26% female. Again, somewhat greater diversity among employment arbitrators. As you may know, uh, I don't want to get into all the gory details. I'm happy on the side to talk with you about this, or we can refer you to the other data. Um, employment arbitrators are often uh, uh, more part-time than many NAA members. Not that all NAA members are full-time, but a, a disproportionate or larger share of NAA arbitrators are full-time. So that's a, another thing I just want to mention. It's not just the sort of m- uh, modest... Uh, diversity that shows in those raw numbers, we also all know, just think about your own personal experience, that the more seasoned arbitrators and mediators are doing a heavier load of cases, in part because they're more likely to be full-time, but in part because they uh, have more requests for their service. So when you would look at the distribution of cases, there's even less Uh, diversity in who's actually hearing cases because of that uh, phenomenon. Okay, the other thing I just want to mention, and then I will turn to the the panel, uh, is in in discussions uh, with the planning committee and the advisory committee, uh, we talked about kind of the steps involved in in bringing aboard a next generation of workplace neutrals. And And we talked about sort of four steps. And I want to just highlight those because we've chosen to emphasize the first three of these steps, and I'll explain a little bit as as to why uh, and all. So the first step is, of course, making this profession, uh, making people aware of the profession, Uh, having students become aware, as we try and do with the ILR school, but having others, having advocates involved in the labor management field aware. And I know a number of your organizations uh, have efforts to do that. Uh, AAA, CPR, FMCS, and others uh, have uh, 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 methods, attempts to bring more 
public and uh, uh, and other uh, focus group awareness that this uh, can be a career. For us at ILR, we often uh, uh, speak to our undergraduates uh, about the opportunity to think about this career, maybe not something they go right into when they graduate, but something they may turn to uh, after going out and being a labor and employment lawyer or an HR manager or an advocate or a union uh, leader. Uh, but I know a number of others of you. So anyway, that's step one, getting people aware of this as a potential uh, uh, occup occupation. Um, a second step, of course, is to teach people how to be a workplace neutral. Um, uh, we do that in our various programs. A number of your organizations have efforts to do that. I'll just mention there's a flyer uh, in your packet uh, on the latest effort we have underway to produce uh, more workplace neutral. We call it the Labor Arbitrator Development Program. It's our third cohort. We had earlier cohorts that produced some of you in this room. Uh, and, and all. So that's, a, that's the, the second step in the process. The third step is, is uh, uh, to get people into the profession actively is to get them started on cases. Because as we all know, it's not, this field is not something you just sit and learn in a classroom. You have to be mentored and coached. And then you actually have to start doing cases and gain acceptability, and, as well as just uh, uh, have the advocates and the users of neutrals aware of, of you and aware of your, your competence. So that's a third key uh, step in, in, in developing new workplace neutral. And the fourth step is what I'd refer to as career deepening, uh, 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 helping those that have entered the profession and have gotten started uh, attain a full array uh, of, of cases, right? More complex cases, uh, a wider variety of cases that often now involves uh, not just labor uh, disputes, employment arbitration, and sometimes you know commercial and other disputes are part of the you know, your portfolio as a as a as a neutral. Okay, here's here's the thing I just wanted to to, to emphasize uh, and, and why I went through that uh, is in the discussion among the planning committee and the advisory committee, we we decided to focus this conference on the first three steps to emphasize getting people started in the profession, right? Not only educated and trained and coached and mentored, but getting them started, getting them started in, you might think of it as more basic uh, uh, cases, and, and not focus uh, much, not, not to exclude discussion and consideration of it, but not to focus much on the fourth stage of getting people uh, a, a full array, a full portfolio in their career. Why did we decide that? We decided that because we came to the view that it would be hard enough to address the first three steps and that we worried if we opened it up as well to the fourth step at this point, it would just be too, too, too messy, too complicated, right? And, and we talked about the idea, we ho I hope we can follow through and do it, is to have another conference uh, whether in person or through uh, a, w a webinar or whatever, but have addressed that four step more directly in, uh, with a focus in subsequent activities that this group may then uh, endorse. Now, I will say that view it w wasn't unanimous. <clears throat> there are some people making serious arguments uh, that that was a mistake, that the more difficult issue was the fourth step and not the first three steps. Not to say they said, oh, there's no issue with the first three steps. They just said, you know, to really address this problem, you've got to head on address the fourth step. And I respect that view, and as others respect it, we just decided as a group, again, not to exclude that issue, and you're welcome to, to contribute to, to, to uh, make points about that issue and maybe direct us to reverse our emphasis at this point. But uh, there was, I just want to forewarn you, there was a lot of discussion about that, and we are emphasizing, not exclusively, but emphasizing these, these earlier steps. Getting people aware of this profession, getting them trained, which of course, as you know, in this profession involves, as we'll talk about, a lot of personal interaction, mentoring, coaching, and guidance, uh, and all. Uh, getting them introduced into work in the profession, and then hopefully, eventually, also we'd be able to focus on that fourth step in a meaningful way. 
Okay? So um, let me now uh, introduce our, our panel and ask them to, to come forward. We, we thought fairly quickly, as we've been trying to do, we wanted to have you all hear from your own people who are actively involved in this profession. And to do that, we're drawing on uh, the individuals who have been a part of the planning committee for that. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them because you uh, know each other and we've got to speed along to get into the substance. Um, we're we're going to go in this order. Sarah Espinoza, uh, 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 Je uh, Jeannie Charles, um, Scott Buckheit, Alan Simonetti, Marty Scheinman, and then Homer in, in, in that order. And I, I will say, Will, I'm going to let each of them sort of give their remarks, have some interaction. Along the way, we, we're, wel we're going to welcome a few comments, but we're going to sort of hold you back and, and have more open, more elaborate discussion uh, facilitated ably uh, by Katrina and Ellen Galen Presida uh, subsequent <laughs> to a coffee break after the session. So if you could hold yourself back unless there's something you just absolutely feel has to be asked about. Uh, because again, I wanted to give them time and then have a process for us all to talk more openly. Okay, I'll turn to Sarah. All Sarah. right, thank you. Thank you, Harry, and thank you all for being here today. I'm going to start off our conversation with just some fairly obvious observations about the practical challenges and barriers that most people face when considering whether or not, and I'm particularly going to be focusing in my comments, on becoming a labor arbitrator. And I also uh, think it's important that we recognize that those challenges are amplified if you are someone who does not meet all or some of the demographic uh, categories um, of uh, a majority of the established arbitrators in the field. So I also want to preface this by saying I'm providing you with my perspective, which is informed by my experience uh, in uh, beginning a labor arbitration and conflict resolution practice nine years ago, um, and also the experiences of my colleagues who are going through that process around that same time. And uh, in doing so, I had the benefit early on of participating in two programs uh, the Scheinman Institute's Labor Arbitrator Development Program, and also the AAA Higginbotham Fellows Program. So I had that benefit of participating in that support early in my career. As you know, uh, becoming a labor arbitrator is not like applying for any other job. Um, you're really uh, creating your own business and practice, and there is a general mysteriousness that surrounds how you actually start off. And so that, that's what I'm going to focus on here. Um, if you're an advocate and you have to also leave your job um, as an advocate, it's really about how do you do that and then how do you find those early cases. And so for a, that subset of a pool of potential new labor arbitrators, uh, those who are currently advocates in the field of labor relations and are not yet of an age uh, where they're eligible to begin to collect their retirement income, that can be a particular uh, economic barrier of, and an added challenge about how you go about moving forward. And when you begin to investigate uh, how you are going to move forward, that can also be fraught, particularly if you're employed as an advocate, uh, because uh, you may fear uh, the perception that will create if your employer comes to learn that you're investigating this possibility, right? Um, and how that may impact you in your own probably successful career um, if you're considering moving into arbitration, um, if you're not quite at the point where you've decided uh, that you're ready to make that switch. So I believe that we lose a lot of promising candidates uh, from our pool when they're in that early contemplation exploration phase. 
And I think uh, that the more support and resources that we can come to uh, to provide those potential candidates, uh, the more we may be able uh, to then help create that inclusive next generation of neutrals as we move forward. Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to present my remarks. Uh, my, my comments are about sort of, my comments are about the, um, the question of where do we find diverse neutrals? I've often heard that mentioned, um, yeah, I would like to diversify, but we, we just don't know where to find any. Um, so and wh while that statement sounds innocent enough, uh, it encapsulates how individuals, groups, or organizations perpetuate environments that lack diversity. So the Harvard, sorry to mention another school here, <laughs> but uh, the Har Harvard Law School uh, Program on Negotiation has a blog on leadership skills. And um, it mentions various studies that have been conducted on how both implicit and explicit, explicit bias can disadvantage racial minorities at the bargaining table. But I think it has much broader implications and um, is relative to the conversation we're having today. So, but it notes that virtually all humans uh, tend to favor people who remind them of themselves uh, in terms of race, gender, religion, and so on. And due to this in-group favoritism, uh, we may find ourselves recommending friends for jobs, writing letters of references for neighbors' children um, and friends and, and so on. So such favors may seem benign, uh, yet uh, we tend to overlook the fact that they disadvantage those who don't look like us. The article points out further that the upper ranks of organizations tend to be dominated by whites, who are more likely to request favors for other whites. Often without conscious intention, whites end up perpetuating inequality and excluding racial minorities. So with that as a backdrop, I believe when it comes to finding diverse neutrals, um, our focus must accomplish three things. We need to adjust our mindsets. We need to be intentional about outreach and uh, we need to engage in sustainable um, activities. So, um, and I think some of what I'm going to say is going to incorporate some of the remarks that, um, that Harry and both Homer made. But when it comes to adjusting our mindsets, um, there must be a full adjustment on this concept. We have to proactively acknowledge creating a balance, and that that is a good thing to do. We must own the idea that we want to do this and that our business environment needs us to do this. Um, this mindset should not have to be legislated. In other words, we have to get to the place as a society that we operate from a mindset of inclusion, not because it is required, but because it is desired. Second, we must be intentional in our efforts and reach out to those who are not in our immediate space. So from the Academy's perspective, uh, with the visionaries like Margie Brogan and Homer LaRue and efforts of our media past president, Su Susan Stewart, and uh, before her, Dan Nielsen, who is also here, uh, and Chris Alberton, who led the Academy's DEI uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Task Force and others within the organization, the Academy has moved to indoctrinate the concept on outreach into our organization. And as you heard from the statistics, it's important that we do that. So it took hard work, uh, and it is a work in progress, 
but I submit that all stakeholders in the labor management community engage in such efforts. And I also want to point out that the process can be uncomfortable. It's not easy because it triggers all types of emotions in us. Um, but it's absolutely necessary to effectuate change. Um, so to push past the cycle of that in-group favoritism I mentioned earlier, we must partner with affinity groups as part of our outreach. And I know Alan has some thoughts about that. Um, but if you'll allow me to give a recent example, so we talked about mentoring in the academy is, is extremely important. We just talked about just generally mentoring the next generation of arbitrators is essential. Um, and so uh, just recently in the southeast region of the academy, we've uh, created our salon, uh, our arbitrator salon, which uh, I know Mar uh, Margie and Homer have led one up in this area, but we have not had that in the southeast region. So um, fortunately, um, I was able to get some of our members to uh, work with me and launching our first salon effort. And for those of you who don't know, the salon is basically an informal gathering of, um, of emerging arbitrators uh, and trying to develop uh, their practices to uh, hopefully get them eligible for membership in the academy. Well, we were having one of our organizational meetings and um, it's basically me and a bunch of white guys in the southeast region. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so we were <laughs> gathering our list of people and, and all the people on the list were a bunch of white guys <laughs> and, and not just me, but we, it became clear to all of us that, you know, we, we got, we have to do more. We have to take additional steps. And so as an example of the outreach to an affinity group, I reached out to Dean Burrell, who is the chair for the National Bar Association uh, ADR section to find out if he knew of any arbitrators in our region, you know, who were, you know, seeking to build their practice. And fortunately, we, I, we were able to identify a couple. And for those who don't know who the National Bar Association is, that's the Bar Association predominantly black uh, attorneys um, that was organized when we couldn't join the ABA. So that's my example of reaching out. And I think we have to, it's important that we continue to do that. And then finally, we have to, uh, the focus and endeavor to create balance has to be sustainable. Uh, for it to be sustainable, we must develop the pipeline of practitioners that we just heard Harry mention. Educational institutions need to include programs on labor law at all levels, not just at at the law school level. Um, and this is not a paid for political announcement for the RCI, but <laughs> um, to really make uh, the idea of managing diversity as a practice, not just as the flavor of the month, um, there must be a strategic intent and effort in place that is measurable. Uh, businesses, practitioners, and appointing agencies should adopt standards that are measurable and tools like the RCI pledges can aid in making a development of diverse environments sustainable. Um, then we won't have, if we, we can implement these efforts, we won't have to find neutrals um, who are from diverse backgrounds. They will already be among us. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. This conference is, of course, about the next generation of neutrals. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the current generation of neutrals. There's many uh, things we will talk about today that I am not well qualified to talk about, but I am very well qualified to talk about the current generation of neutrals. I am male. I am white. And I'm above 70 years old. <laughs> take, it, take in your own mind, take a guess as to what percentage of uh, neutrals in the academy are above 70 years old. And if we were betting, 
over under. I'm going to think that the over would win. The answer is 70 percent of neutrals in the academy as of 2020 were above 70 years old. What that means is that even though I've been doing this profession for 40 years after uh, as of this year, I am still in the younger half <laughs> of those of the current generation of labor arbitrators. So let me talk about my g -g generation. And those of you of a certain age may recognize that that's a reference to one of my favorite music groups, The Who, and their song, My Generation. And unlike Peter Townsend and Roger Daltrey might have imagined, we have not wanted to die before we get old. <laughs> At least professionally, we have uh, not wanted to. We are here, we are present, we are a consideration in terms of what happens in the future. And the question is, will the current generation be part of the solution or part of the problem? Will we be a barrier or will we be a propellant in terms of moving forward with the uh, next generation of neutrals? And I'm going to put forth three reasons why I think there's reasons to be pessimistic about the next generation, uh, the current generation being a helpful resource in the next generation creation, and three reasons to be optimistic about that. First of all, in terms of the three reasons to think that the, next, the current generation will not be particularly helpful, number one, there are people in my generation who simply do not believe that there should be any efforts to be done at all in terms of influencing what the next generation of neutrals will, will be. Um, look, to some of you, you may not hear the word woke when you have these types of discussions to people. We may not hear that word within our own internal discussions over the next day and a half. But I assure you, when I talk to colleagues, many of which I respect, admire, and are friends, the word woke, whatever that means, and the concept behind it do come to the surface. It's a real feeling. And I don't mean to imply bad faith among people there. There's simply people that believe the essence of the profession is that there should be no engineering done, quote unquote, um, at all in that regard. Second, we have to be aware of this. Let's be candid about this. There was from a previous generation to me, a, professor, a person who said, an arbitrator who said, and I'll paraphrase here a little bit, famously or maybe infam infamously, that you show me a new arbitrator, I'll show you someone who has his hand in my pocket. And there is a fear of financial consequence to the establishment of a next generation of neutrals. Be it diverse or not diverse, there are people who don't want a next generation of neutrals because they do not perceive it in their own interest to have a next generation of neutrals. And that brings me to the third reason in terms of why there may be headwinds in terms of the current uh, profession, and that being that change is hard. Look, it just is. No matter what the change is, things have been set the way they are for a long time. And for a lot of people, people up on this panel, other people, things are good. Why do we want change? I just moved yesterday from a house I lived in 38 years. It was hard. It's just hard for change. It's hard to get things put in motion. You know, the, the old law, things that are in motion tend to stay in motion, but things that are stopped stay, tend to stay stopped. So um, there are those headwinds. But let's talk about the reasons there are to be optimistic about creating a next generation of diverse neutrals. 
First of all, the first part of that, creating the next generation, this has happened before. When I started as an arbitrator, there was a whole generation from the War Labor Board arbitrators, and they had the field to themselves. And they were at the end of their careers in the early 80s. And the question then, as now was, what's the next generation going to be? It wasn't really apparent where the new arbitrators were going to come from. And they took it upon themselves, informally, formally, to mentor, to guide, to support, to encourage many of us who are in this room and on this panel here today. So it's the, the problem's been confronted before, it's been addressed before, and the generation before us showed us that we can be encouraging in terms of supporting a next generation of neutrals. Second, it's a legacy thing, right, in terms of the current generation. Harry talks about the retirement, the upcoming retirement of the current generation of neutrals. But let's be candid about this. Harry's putting it nicely. <laughs> yes, some of us will choose to retire, but most of us will not choose to retire. But what will happen? We're going to get disabled. We're going to die. Can I say it? <laughs> and so whether we like it or not, there is going to be a next generation of neutrals, or they're not going to be neutrals. You know, we've heard said there is, there's sort of a shortage of well-trained, well-qualified neutrals now. I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I think presently, there are many well-qualified in the traditional sense neutrals out there. But I'm gonna say that 10 years from now, pick a number. 70% of the arbitrations people are sitting in those chairs today are not going to be sitting in those chairs in, in 10 years. So there's a really great opportunity for those of us of the current generation to do our legacy thing and mentor, guide, support people for the next generation. And in the proposals we're talking about here, they are rich with opportunities for uh, us to do that. And look, like anyone, we as individuals, not looking at it globally, but looking at it individually, individual arbitrators of the current generation say, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And I think that's a very legitimate question. And the answer is, yes, we might have some thoughts that societally it's a good thing to do. But there's both a macro and a micro component of what's in it for me. The macro component is if we want to stay relevant as a profession, we need to address this. We cannot go forward ignoring it. But at a micro level, at an individual level, it makes our lives better, I would argue. It makes us better arbitrators. And I will... I'll give you one example of that. I had an opportunity this year to engage in a professional um, piece of work that involved a number of arbitrators, some of which were American and some of which were Canadian. And we went out to dinner one night and we sat around a table and there were maybe eight to 10 of us there. And it occurred to us that we were half Canadian and half American. So we started talking about labor relations things, situations from a Canadian perspective and an American perspective. And some of it was institutional. And I suspect I could have read a book and got some of that information. But some of it was soft information, feelings, approaches, attitudes. And as a result of that conversation that night, I came away with a richer understanding of my profession. I came away with new perspectives. I came away a better, more engaged arbitrator by being with people internally in my own profession who had different perspectives on things than what I had. 
And what that showed to me is two things. First of all, diversity has a very broad component to it. It's, it's not just about race. It's not just about sex. It's not even just about age. There's lots of ways to show diversity. Up here, some of us are wearing ties and some of us aren't. <laughs> but not to be flipped. There's lots of components to diversity, and we have to keep that in mind. And there's lots of benefits to us as individual arbitrators to seize upon the opportunity to engage with and support the next generation of diverse neutrals. One more thing before I close here. Look, I'm in some ways an embodiment of that. I sort of, at the beginning, explained how I was, how close, how I was. I was never particularly engaged in this process before. But I spoke to my dear friend Marty one night. He invited me over to his place. We had a long conversation about his passion for this. One night, my dear friend Homer took me aside and talked in terms of what he was trying to do and engaged me. He brought me along. Alan, sitting next to me, I heard him say about how it was essential to our profession to have a next generation of inclusive uh, neutrals. My dear friend Margie Brogan, I was inspired by the things she did in terms of the salon and many other people in this room here. And that all had an impact on me. So we are not going to f f fade away as a generation. Another who reference there, as you may know. Um, but don't work around us. Work with us. Let us be part of the solution. And if you do, we will not be part of the problem. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Scott. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to kind of approach this in a different manner. Um, uh, I am kind of going to approach this in a more m macro uh, vision. Uh, and... It is my thinking that we are presented at this time with a unique opportunity. Um, first, the macro vision. Um, as many of you all know, I, I live and work outside of Philadelphia. And um, there is a phrase that some of us who have followed the Sixers for several years have used and that is, quote unquote, trust the process. Um, and this is what we have here is a very important, critical process of d resolving workplace disputes. And we have to make affirmative steps in order to facilitate the trust in this particular process. Um, so the question that we're, and the challenge that we're faced with in a macro view is how do we encourage and preserve that trust when we are in a divided society in which many of our, inst there is diminishing trust in many of our institutions. <laughs> Us, we involved in, uh, who are involved in, um, Dispute resolution also faced those challenges. Um, so um, how do we approach this system? Here is a very interesting opportunity. First of all, many of you who have been involved in this business for many, many years have known that there have been a lot of efforts to increase the number of arbitrators, to increase the diversity of arbitrators. In essence, when what we're talking about up here is really not that new when it comes down to it. But we are faced with a number of circumstances right now that, first of all, uh, we're looking at, we're coming out of a pandemic that influences how we work together as a community. We have uh, questions regarding identity that are challenging to all of us. And so now, even though we recognize the need to, um, to make progress in the areas of recruitment 
and diversity of uh, people of identity, rising identities, uh, we have pretty much, in a sense, worked in our silos. Um, I look around the room, and there are a number of individuals from appointing agencies who have been engaged in processes of recruiting and, 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 and training arbitrators in this, in this field um, and have made, I would say, moderate success. But um, I, 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 as I was thinking and preparing this, I just heard what my colleague Scott uh, just mentioned. Um, uh, in a sense, I've been practicing 35 years, and I'm still an outlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's think about that. Uh, I'm 68, Scott. <laughs> 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 and, and that's scary. I'm, I'm, I'm still considered a young guy. Uh, yeah, Margie and I have a running joke. We've known each other for 40 years that uh, she's one month younger than I am. <laughs> and and uh, we have both been practicing over 30 years. Uh, when I joined the academy, I, was, I wasn't even in the first 15 individuals of African descent uh, to join the academy. I joined the academy, academy in 1995, and that is from 1947 mm -hmm. to 1995. Um, at the same time, as Harry has mentioned, even though we're talking about it, there's been a lot of efforts by many of you um, the percentages and the numbers have not really moved that much. So where are we now? We have to ask ourselves, what shall we do now that we, have, we are now living in a divided society with lack of trust in institutions? Mm -hmm. with, uh, and despite our great efforts over the years, we have not moved the needle. Uh, and as a result, given those challenges, we are facing diminishing trust in this important institution of workplace dispute resolution. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to come together for at least to discuss some areas of cross-pollinization um, in order to uh, take advantage of the, the, the issues that we face now, lack of diversity and a, and a generational change in arbitration. Um, that doesn't happen too often. We should take advantage of it right now. So um, I'm going to now shift a little bit to talk about some of those challenges that we do have. And the challenges and meeting those challenges may force us to reconsider some very, um, uh, uh, very important principles that we have that form the basis of arbitration. Um, let's take a minute to talk about the economic barriers um, that we face for developing new arbitrators. Uh, I, Sarah pointed out some of the questions. I can share my story uh, because I am an outlier. I am an outlier. Uh, uh, I uh, am uh, a, a black man who started arbitrating at the age of 35 with uh, a two-year-old um, uh, and at the time, and soon thereafter, two more sons. Now, one of the things I, I promised my kids I would not do is start a phrase with well, back in the day, <laughs> uh, I have been warned, you know, there are articles out there in the Times about the worst thing you could do to engage your younger uh, children, the younger, is to start with that phrase. <laughs> but I am going to start with that phrase right now. Uh, I was blessed because I came up in a cohesive community of labor and management practitioners. Uh, most of us, um, and I can look around the room, and right now at least three of my colleagues here worked in the same office at Region 4 of the National Labor Relations Board. And during that time, there was a large cohesive community of labor and management practitioners who, under the auspices of, at the time, IRA, 
would have monthly meetings uh, basically to discuss best practices in labor relations. Uh, basically, that is how you got known. So when I got my first case back in 1988, um, I, the, the attorney that selected me said, you know, I, I, I kind of remembered you from the board. And I don't know how your decision making is, but I know that due to your training with the board, you know how to run a hearing at least. So we decided to give you a chance. Um, that was what the statement was. Um, now, I wonder, uh, we do not have, the, the board activity has diminished a lot over the years. Thanks to the diminishing amount of labor organization and union organization in this country, there is not that, that large a community of practitioners to engage with. And now one of the elements of mentoring and talking with um, uh, new arbitrators is kind of iffy now. I don't, I'm still trying to, I know how to do Zoom. <laughs> Trust me, I know how to do Zoom. Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, but am I really engaging individuals over this platform? How do we use all these new technologies in order to provide mentor? Finally, there's something that is always, um, that has not changed. And that is the challenges facing younger arbitrators, especially want to go in labor management relations, where uh, in order to go into a practice, one has to essentially give up what they were doing for years before. Um, when I started, um, and one of the best things I learned is if you have a legal license and you can't do labor anymore, at least you can write a will. Uh, um, and so that kind of puts some money in your pocket. At, at that point. Uh, but at the same time, it, in, a, uh, in order for me to become an arbitrator with the FMCS, for example, I had to give up, which was turning out to be a decent workers' compensation practice. Um, now, mind you, as I said earlier, I had a two-year-old, and there were two more out there in the spirit somewhere <laughs> that were going to show up sooner or later. Um, uh, my wife and I had to provide for them. Um, now that I think about it, I'm, I was crazy. And, and I also, the first word I tell individuals, especially if they're young, if they're going to be arbitrators, is one, don't do this at home. <laughs> because make sure your, financi your finances are in order before you try to do this. Um, my colleague here to my left, and I have been going back and forth to talk about this because the question becomes, and I'm going to throw it out there, um, what does that say about the requirement of neutrality in order to, uh, 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 to encourage young arbitrators to get into the practice? Um, my take has always been, and I've talked to Marty a lot about this, is that really is neutrals is really not our call. As advocates, that's your call because it goes to the trust of the system. Um, in labor management relations, individuals selected arbitrators based upon their neutrality. Um, but in order to get that neutrality, there are certain economic risks involved. I think we have to talk about that at some point. That goes to one of the fundamental bases of arbitration. Uh, and we just can't avoid that at this point. So I'm going to end right now and turn it over to my colleague, Marty, because I know he has some thoughts about this as well. Uh, thank you for my couple of minutes.
Well, actually, I got the memo that said we had 10 minutes each, so I made much longer. So, <laughs> first of all, in terms of a tie, I'm just thrilled to be wearing long pants. And so, for, for those of you who don't know this, I just want to help you. When your clothes hang in the closet for a long time, they tend to shrink. I just want you to know that. I learned that this morning. It may not be what you experienced, but what I experienced this morning. Um, so, I, I just want to start, and I'm going to get to where Alan was in a second. Uh, I've been asked to really talk about two things, what the Scheinman Institute is and what we try to do and what I do in my own practice, because it's a little different about this. But we asked you all to be here, uh, I think, under a fundamental premise. And that premise was how we've been doing it hasn't worked. It's failed. And unless we acknowledge that, that, you know, it's the definition of insanity to, can, to expect a different result. Harry's research, David's research, Alex's research have just told us what we all knew anecdotally, that people who are arbitrary tend to look like me. And that doesn't mean that there's not a place for people like me. It just means that that it ought to be the kind of profession that reflects what's going on in the real world. And this sort of resistance that Scott talked about, I've heard it a million times when we started the Institute, like, why are you doing this? There's plenty of people who don't have work. And I always use the analogy when I used to own restaurants that um, I'm not worried about another restaurant on the street. I'm worried about a bad restaurant on the street because then people will stop coming to the street. But if one night you want Thai and one night you want Italian and one night you want steak, let them all be there because people are going to get used to that. So I believe that our idea was to get, and our tagline, which when we did this some 12 or 15 years ago, was to educate the next generation of neutrals and practitioners. Because it was naive, we thought, and David Lipsky convinced me of that, and Harry Katz, who now runs it, and Alex has, that we have to realize that the world is probably going to come from practitioners. And unless they're educated and understand it and see collective bargaining and see negotiations the way we see it as a noble cause for a noble career that can make changes in working people's lives, but also make change in society. And the premise that I have in my life is to talk about this is that conflict is not a failure of a relationship. Conflict is implicit in a relationship. And once we accept that, that life is messy, that my, and we all have messy lives. And people tell me, well, am I disqualified to being a neutral because of? I said, if that was the list, I assure you I wouldn't be an arbitrator. Okay? A messy divorce, a messy childhood, a messy interpersonal relationships. And there is a place in this for all of us to acknowledge that and that frankly, to, to, to sort of segue, is that, yes, it is a profession, and it may be a calling, being what we do, but it isn't supposed to be a vow of poverty. People should not have to decide whether or not to be able to take care of their two-year-old or whether or not they should go out. So just to comment for a moment on what Alan was talking about, I have long believed, and Christine's here, and I, this is, a, well, is the end of my remarks, but let me at least foreshadow this part because it may not have been clear to everybody. I've been of the view that this notion that the parties could not pick an arbitrator who also had a practice in our field was bizarre to me. This idea that somehow because so-and-so is a union leader, you all know this, or maybe you don't, if you look at an employment panel that I, I, I speak in part as, as co-chair of the National Labor Relations Labor Management Committee, I think we're called, for the American Arbitration Association, where I serve, uh, that if you look at the other, uh, other panels with the AAA and many other places, there are advocates on those panels. Everybody knows about it. It's disclosed. There's no secret about it. And I say, if, 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 if these parties decide to select, I don't want to pick any name, but they'll all be one of my colleagues, even though you spend your time as the general counsel of the UFT, or even though you spend your... your, your time as the general counsel of the Postal Service. Why should they be precluded by these agencies and us from saying, do it? And obviously, it's not surprising, since an economic barrier exists for all this, that who's more likely to have the economic wherewithal, what Gene has talked about, in terms of their life and their lifestyle, 
So congratulations. You want all rich people who are able to afford this? Is that what that is reflective? So to me, this has been a difficult conversation. And to be honest with you, we've argued about it. You know, I've been told that I'm going to, if I push this through with the help of my colleagues, I'm going to destroy neutrality as an essence of being a neutral. I said, you know, so the, what you're basically saying to me is when you pledge the fraternity and when you pledge the sorority, these were the rules. Let's keep them the same. And I remind people, hazing is now illegal. <laughs> things change and we can do things differently. And I don't know why we're so afraid to trust the parties to make a judgment. If you disclose who you are and these parties decide to select you, God bless them. And frankly, I, I have a lot of ideas about this. I don't want to talk about this right now. But there are many ways in which of doing this as long as people know about it. And maybe it shouldn't be forever. And maybe it shouldn't be every advocate in the country. And maybe we should honestly say that, that the organizations like the FMCS and, and, and by and et cetera could say, look, we know where we have a shortage of people. Maybe those people should be able to have different rules for some period of time. That they are totally, remember what we're talking about when we talk about this. People who are otherwise totally acceptable to the agency, completely qualified, who are solely disqualified because they have another job. Just think about that. There's nothing else that we do in any of our lives. If I decide I want to go buy a piece of real estate, no one says you can't do that because you're an arbitrator. So, so I just want to make that point to, for people to say, what does he mean by impartiality or neutrality? It's not that the person is not personally neutral. It's that they are perceived as not having the cloak of neutrality because they also do something else in their other lives. And I think that we should think about that. All right. So let me just talk a little bit what I was supposed to talk about um, uh, other than my tie. Um, the Scheinman Institute was developed for this idea. And basically it had two different areas. Uh, to to educate, to increase the skills, the, um, the the mentorship, all of that for people like you, our age or, or or adults, to go out to understand more, to improve their skill set, to probably be more acclimated into things that weren't opportunities, and also in the back of the mind for all of you who are advocates, think maybe someday I would like to be a neutral, maybe not, maybe so, maybe it's not for me, but we're going to do, run programs, training, mentorships, fellowships. And that's done for the entire adult problem. And we talk about that. The other component, which I thought was even more important, was a farm system. To try to cultivate in young people, newer people, students, graduate students, undergraduate students, law students, business students, the opportunity to hear about this as a profession, that it was noble, that you didn't have to be poor, that you can make a good living, that you can work for yourself. And one of the things I try to emphasize all the time, some of my students here, is that you can be yourself. This profession does not require you to look like me, to talk like me, to be as aggressive as I am. Some of the most successful people are completely different. And who you, your politics, where you spend your other time, who you're married to, none of this is dispositive. And that's one of the great joys of working for yourself. And I have found in my own practice that the more I am honest about that, the more I'm acceptable. People know it's genuine. It's not, and it's not disqualifying, which many young people think, well, if I'm gay or I'm, my politics fall this way or this is the kind of things I like to do in my private life, is this going to mean I can't be an arbitrator? And believe it or not, they think that and they ask that and they're worried about that. And this is an opportunity that we've had to have students. And we do scrimmages between different schools about arbitration. We have fellowships. We have mentorships. We, we push our board, which is incredibly talented, and a board of advisors and very diverse, to engage with our students, to offer them jobs, to push them into the field, because otherwise they're going to sit there in Ithaca or in New York City, where as the case may be, and not have any opportunities. Um, we also develop literally courses. I, I teach a course up there called the Practice of Labor Arbitration with Harry. I've done it with, uh, with Ariel Avgar. I've done it with David Lipsky. Uh, and that teaches students for four days how to become an arbitrator. We do mediation programs so they can understand it for the first time, that this is really a way you can make a living. And we emphasize the fact that your personal skills already permit you to do a lot of this. You don't have to start at ground zero. 
and that um, you do not have to think that your life experiences are less important than our life experiences. Because the people who you're going to arbitrate before or who you're going to mediate with have those kinds of experiences, and you can probably bring something that I can't bring. Um, they even developed, ironically, and this shows you how people can get when they're excited. The students themselves now have a club. One day I show up and says, are you coming to the Shining Club? I'm thinking, uh-oh, what do they do now? <laughs> you know, it's one of the funny things when you endow something. Someone will say, Shyman says. I'm saying, uh, okay, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> but but the, you, you, Shyman wrote. Mm, I don't think so. And so it's pretty funny. The other thing I told somebody's story, Alex holds the, the Martin F. Shyman Professor of Conflict Resolution. And he and I don't agree on everything, which is lovely. So he'll write something, and I'll get a letter from somebody. I can't believe you said the following. I said, Where? When you were in Toronto, I haven't been to Toronto in five years. It, it was probably COVID, so he, so, he, so that's what's responsible. All right. Um, so this has been successful, but it's been too, it was too anecdotal. We recognized, and that was this discussion that you can get some people. The, the institute's done a great job in getting more people. I want to, my colleagues don't get angry with me, but we needed to do more. We needed to be more a systemic way of introducing people to this profession. And so one of the things I decided I should do, and this is what I'm going to talk about to finish up, is I thought that I should try a different model. And I'm, I'm a regular arbitrator like everybody else knows, and I, um, I, I was advantaged by having people who helped me, who brought me around, who introduced me, who let me write for them. And by the way, it was all this big secret, which I never understood. One of the big things that we have done poorly, that people who write these awards, it's like you don't know who it is. And I always laughed. I said, there's somebody who issues 150 awards a year. You think he or she sits there and writes 150 awards a year? Have you ever tried to do this? Are you kidding me? So, oh, they must have a helper. Who? I don't know. I don't know. There must be someone. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I also was told early on, I don't know if I ever told you guys this story, by one of our great founders, you should have assistants, but you shouldn't pay them. That, 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 uh, that ruins the relationship. And those of you know my mouth, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you joking? You're not going to pay. No, I never pay anybody. Well, I pay everybody, okay? <laughs> I don't believe in that. I think it's wrong, et cetera. So what I did is I realized that um, I'm going to do something else. I've always had a person who worked for me. I always had one person at a time. Once I became, had enough practice that I could afford it, so at first I had to figure out how to pay for myself. And mm -hmm. by the way, you've seen that being an arbitrator is can adequately feed you at looking at me. And so um, what I would say is I decided we're going to do something else. What did we do differently? I became, some of you were annoyed at me, it no longer was a Martin F. Scheinman Esquire arbitrator. It now became Scheinman Arbitration and Mediation Services. Sam's, because we're so creative. Anyway, so, and what did we do? We built, I built a, a, an office in Port Washington with a, a, a conference center where we have rooms. Christine yells at me about that. And so with rooms, and I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bring other people into this practice. That I believe there is an opportunity to bring in someone else. And I can tell you the evolution of it. And we have different people. There's, there's four of us together. Um, one is a, my partner, who's a white male. One of them is a colleague, or I call associated with the firm, who is a black man. And one of who's associated with the firm is a white woman. And by the way, it's 100% right what people tell you. You get better ideas from people who have different ideas and different backgrounds. And so what happened is they come in, and what we do is in order to help some of the things that Alan's discussed about, I have different arrangements with everyone for the last five years. Um, we sometimes work together, some big mediations. Some know there was a strike in New York City. And again, telling the parties, there's no way you can do this by yourself. And we work together to do this together with people doing different assignments. Some very large cases I've had, everybody who's been known beforehand that they're going to be there, that there's going to be motion practice, there's going to be a million things to happen, especially in employment cases. There's no way that I can handle this myself. When I get a selection from AAA or from FMCS or I get one from PERB or OCB or from uh, PERC, for example, I don't do this. I'm just a regular arbitrator. They're regular arbitrators. But what we have done here is created an environment where we say, look, when I became the arbitrator, I, I, I'll tell the story. It's not a secret. When I became the arbitrator recently in baseball, some of you know I have that assignment. 
And they said, would you take it on? I said, I'll take it on, but I don't want to mislead you. There is no chance in the world I can do this by myself. I can't do it. I don't have the time. I don't have the ability. And I don't have the bandwidth. And so I said, I'm going to have people who help me write. When there's some kind of crazy things that has to be done immediately, they'll try to get me from a hearing. If not, they'll handle it. Obviously, I'm going to decide all of those. What do you think about it? And everybody said, oh, my God, it's never been done. You know what they said? Sounds great. I walk into an arbitration today, ladies and gentlemen, where there are five lawyers representing one side and five lawyers representing the other and a transcript. And it's like, I'm supposed to handle all that by myself. I'm lying to you if I say I do. It's not what's happening. And so we have done this in a more organized way, which has been pretty, uh, it's incredibly interesting to do a mediation with two other people. It's incredibly interesting to do an arbitration when you have somebody there helping you and the, and the parties know about it. But it's also incredibly rewarding to see these people be like your kids. You know, I, I tell them, people say, what is it like with the old assistants yet? Just like your children. They have no time for me anymore. They don't call me back anymore. They, they deny they work with me at any point. <laughs> they, they, they disavow. Who? Who is that? Did, didn't I pay you for seven years? I don't think so. so. But that's all fine and dandy. And that's but this model, I suggest to you, is not so unique. I said this to Ellen last night. In the day, days of Zoom and all the like, you could partner with people. My friends who have these kinds of practices could bring in more people, could help them, could have them help you. That's what's in it for you. They help me immensely. I help them hopefully immensely. Some of them are now arbitrators on all your panels, have become very successful. And the reality is they don't have to worry about paying for their two-year-olds. And that is my responsibility. It is my responsibility to make sure that when they jump, they don't have to be afraid that I can't pay my mortgage. And I don't take on anybody that I'm not. Now, I'm, I was not 70 in 22 when the, when the, uh, the, when the uh, survey was done, so I'm not in your stupid category. But I am now 70. So as being 70, you know, I say to people, I am going to die. Okay, I am. I don't. I, I, was kill, I was killing with Pam last night. The party we settled the case last night. There was a big deal. And party said, "What did you, we want? One, two, two concessions for you. One, you'll meet with us. But number two, you have to pr promise not to retire or die." I said, "Well, I won't retire. I can't promise you the other one." If I said you got to call my wife for those of you who met last night because she's going to make me eat better, and I'm not going to eat better, so I can't promise you that. Anyway, I just want to make this point: there are other models, and what we're doing doesn't work. Not that it might work. Or didn't. Look, everybody here is sincere. Every one of these agencies has spent enormous resources and time in doing it. But the bottom line is you tell me what's going on. You tell me the numbers. Don't tell me anything else. I don't care about it. And then what, I, I love him, and him and I disagree. I, I, I had arguments with the, the, the ex-president of the academy. I just kept on saying, tell me how it's going to change. If you have, and, and it's not. And that's what in part led us to today, which is saying to you all, who are the difference makers? We're not the difference makers. You are the difference makers. Either as an advocate you are or because your agency can do this. Tell me what you're allowed to do, and we will help you do it, and we will do it. The only last comment I would make is we spend too little time, I think, applauding ourselves that what we do is important. It's important in Canada. It's important in the United States. We are peacemakers. We could make, I could have made a lot more money being a corporate lawyer. Okay? I could have done a lot more things if I want. I guess I could have written wills. I tell people I'm not a real lawyer. They say, how do you know you're not a real lawyer? I said, because if you have a parking ticket, I probably could get your life. There's a chance you might get the death penalty. But that's how I decided. But it's a chance. It's up in the air. It's not really clear. And so I just make a suggestion to everyone that there are other models. Mine's not the only one. But I'm not so bold that I took this great chance. I just believe the parties were more mature than everybody else did. I thought the parties would say, of course. And I also thought the parties, I had a colleague well, last night, I talked about this when we were at my apartment, who said, this is a huge problem for the parties. It's not a huge problem for me. It's your problem. When I retire, I'm going to retire or die, whichever the case may be. And I'm sorry. But if you all don't help us figure out a better way to do this, 
You're not going to encourage young people because they all think we're crazy to do this. You know, a lot of people, you know, we ought to talk about what it is. It's great. If I know all of you work in organizations, but it's pretty cool working for yourself. It's pretty cool being able to decide your own life. You know, I have kids who work in all these companies and, you know, 30,000 people get laid off and they all freak out for two and a half weeks about whether it's going to be them. And all I think to myself is I never experienced that. Never experienced that. And so I encourage some of you to come over here with us. I just want to make it clear that's part of it. But I also encourage you to think what could we do differently because it's not working. Last comment I'll make, if I can, is about the differences between men and women. Women and others. You know the story, I guess. I'll leave with this. About the uh, the the CIA had decided to uh, recruit for an assassin. Do you know the story, anybody? So they go through this huge, huge process. And they get down to three finalists. And the three finalists are brought in for the uh, final interview. And they go to the first finalist, the man, and they say to the man, all right, here's this. This is the last test. Here is a gun. Your wife is in the other room. You have to take the gun and go in and kill her. Guy goes into the room, comes back, just shaking. He says, I, I couldn't do it. So the CIA person says, well, I guess you're not right for this job. Next person comes in, male. He says, all right, here's the deal. You got to go inside. You got to kill your eldest child. Guy comes in. Now he's hysterical, crying. I always wanted to be a CIA agent. I guess I'm just not suited for it. The third person is a woman. She comes in. He gives her the gun. He says, you got to take this gun and go inside and you have to kill your husband. He's in the other room. She disappears for about five minutes. Crashing, banging, stuff all over the place. She comes out sopping wet. They say, what happened? She says, some idiot put a blank in the gun. I had to break up the furniture and beat him to death. So women have talents that men do not have. I want you to remember. Thank you. With that and without the permission of the, of the conveners, I'm going to call an audible and allow everybody to stand for the seventh inning stretch. And then we'll finish up, and I promise to be as brief as I can. But please stay in the room, except I have to leave the room for a moment. I just did. And there's the real reason. I shouldn't pass that bathroom. I just say that.